Well, today we're going to start a new series. Uh, the series is called The Battle for Your Heart. It's a series on spiritual warfare. It's a reality that one thing I've noticed over time is it's inescapable. You see good and evil just all around us. We see it in the world today, don't you? Maybe more than ever, it's just like the rise of evil in our world. I'm like, this is, this is terrible. But then this, this just war with good and evil going on and realizing that that's just this picture of this battle that rages every day between God and the evil one. God and Satan. And the truth is, the battle is happening right here. The battle isn't for territory, it's for your heart. The very essence of Satan's tactics that the flesh desires and oftentimes the world um, really tries to project is this. Whatever it takes to capture your heart's affections, that's what he wants to do. Make no mistake about it, we're in a war. And I think that the, the thing that really causes me to shudder is this, that the church often doesn't think we're in a war. That God's people go through life oftentimes with these blinders on, with this total misunderstanding that I'm in a battle. Because the evil one wants your heart and the essence of the Old Testament and the New Testament, if I could put it into one thing, Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with most of your heart. <laughs> no, it's with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the greatest commandment. You wanna boil it down? It's a battle for your heart because Satan wants to steal everything that God designed for you. And where does it take place? It takes place in your heart. The very essence of who you are. I think we've been lulled to sleep into thinking that we're not in a battle. The greatest tactic that the enemy could produce is to cause us to think that we're not in a battle. Why? Because then it doesn't matter. And I often say, how do we get here as a country? How do we get here as a church? Because the country's in a tailspin. The church is an identity crisis. We're a mess. And you go, well, how do we get here? Was it one big leap? No, it was one little step at a time. And we find ourselves in a place we never thought we'd be. The godlessness that I see in our country the lack of God within church itself, oftentimes, it's, it's chilling. So we as a people, we as a church, need to wake up and understand this reality. I've entitled uh, today's sermon to kick this off, Sound the Alarm. Sound the Alarm. And it's really a call to wake up. Have you ever had somebody look you in the eyes and say, would you please wake up? Have you ever had that? Somebody just honestly, they love you enough to say, man, you are lost. You've lost your mind. You've lost your sense of whatever, what's right, but you need to wake up. But sound the alarm. We, need, we as a people need to wake up. It was funny, um, I was thinking about this. It was when my kids were playing uh, high school basketball. We were in the gym. And as they were playing, the fire alarm went off. And I was like, this is such, such a bad thing, you know, to happen. We're in the middle of a game. Don't they know? You know, we're, we're playing an important game. These are all NBA, future NBA stars. It's <laughs> what every parent thinks, right? We have a bunch of future MBAers here, and now the fire alarm goes off. So we did whatever, what every responsible parent would do in a moment like that as we sat there and cheered our kids on. 
and totally, um, you know, turned a, a deaf ear to the alarm that was going off. And I'm not kidding. There's all the parents and, the, and then all the, the spectators in the stands, and we're cheering our kids on. The refs are still going. And finally, somebody comes in the gym and says, all right, everybody out. Man, this was inconvenient. I mean, everybody out. The players had to go out with just their shorts and, and their jerseys on. They went out. It was freezing. And so we're all sitting in cars outside going, just hit the reset button. Why, why is this happening? It's such an inconvenience. And then we saw flames. <laughs> and it was like, oh, there's a fire. Who would have known? And we have become so desensitized oftentimes by alarms. I mean, we had one here at the church last week in between services. 9.42, an alarm goes off. Fire alarm. Everything. I'm like, oh, man, what's going on? I see people like, so how, how are things at the house? You know, and everybody's just still gathered in here. They're chatting and talking until an usher comes in. and He goes, everybody out. And they're like. What? And so we become desensitized oftentimes by the warnings around us. And I want to, I really want to sound the alarm. I want to look in the eyes of the church and say this, wake up, wake up. We need to recognize who we are and what is going on in the name of of life right now. And I want to take you to a passage of scripture where Paul speaks that into a church in Ephesus and he says very similar words and I, I, I just think we can learn a lot from it today. It's in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. And verse 14 is like the key verse for us today. So let's start at verse 1 because... Verse 1, he begins with the word therefore, and he's talking about the fact that these people had confessed Jesus Christ as their Savior. They had made a profession of faith, and it wasn't just all over after that. It was just beginning. The battle that was going to rage in their life was just starting. When they gave their life to Jesus, when they gave their heart to Jesus, he reformed it, he changed it, and the evil one was coming to try to to ruin it, to steal it, to destroy it, to destroy everything that God desired good, he wanted to ruin. And so listen to what it says. Therefore, now that you're believers, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of these things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. This is our key verse. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Awake, O sleeper. He looks at these believers, these new believers, and he challenges them with how they're living, but he calls them to wake up. He goes, you've fallen asleep to the reality that you're in a war. 
And he calls them out of this lifestyle that they were in, and he calls them to the beauty of what God desires for them. But we must wake up to this reality that you're in a war. I think we've been lulled to sleep. Did you wake up today and think, man, there's a battle for my heart today? Do we go to work thinking, you know, when I get there, there's a battle for my heart today? When I'm out doing the things that I enjoy recreation-wise, do I think there's a battle for my heart today? I'm here to declare to you that there's a battle every day for your heart. Every night that you put your head on the pillow, even in the thoughts that you have while you sleep, there's a battle for your heart. There's a real war that's raging. And we must not be blind or deaf to this reality. We must know that it is true. The goal is to capture your heart so that it's not given to the person in the work of God. And he will use all kinds of tactics. As I was reading through this and I was reading through scripture and, and just considering what that looks like, there were three things that came to mind regarding our heart that I see in scripture that are evidence that often the evil one will use against us to take our heart and divide it or in some way to take away what God intended for it so it was not fully devoted to him. The first one is a distracted heart. He will try to keep us busy and distracted so that we have no sense of, of our relationship with God, of what Christianity and our, my faith really means in the world of which I live. Have you ever been there? You're just so busy that, you know, they say if you get distracted and you, I can keep you busy, then you're ineffective. And if there's one word I hear in our world, no matter who I talk to, how you doing? I'm doing great, but man, I'm busy. And we need to be careful that the busyness of life has not caused us to lose sight of the fact that there's a war, there's a battle for your heart, your heart's affections, your heart's attention, and your heart's worship, because it was to be given to God completely and fully. So first, a distracted heart. The other one is a discouraged heart. I see it all the time. Have you ever hit a moment of discouragement and you're just like, it doesn't, nothing matters anymore. I've had moments in my life where I've just, you know, been so down and so discouraged. It's just like, does it matter? Who cares? I think we've probably all been there at some point in time. But a discouraged heart is something that the evil one will use in such a way to take away and steal away everything that God wants for us. So I'm not thinking about kingdom stuff. I'm not thinking about God's stuff. I'm thinking about my stuff. And my heart is so overwhelmed with the reality of life that I've lost sight of anything. And so I have a discouraged heart. Then there's a divided heart. You know, like I said in scripture, when you start looking at scripture, you understand that he didn't say most, some, he said all that we would serve God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. I want you to think in relation to this. This really helped me. What does a divided heart look like within the context of a human relationship? Husband and wife. If you're married and your spouse starts to develop a divided heart, is that kind of like okay? Is that good? Is that something that's going to lead to health or destruction? I think we all know the answer to those questions. And, and yet, within the context of our spiritual walk, our relationship with God, sometimes what happens is it's not that I don't love God. I just don't love him with all my heart. I love him with some of it. I give God a segment. I give him 50% of it but I've got 50% that I'm trying to do these other things. And he says this, above anything, God wants all your heart. Above anything, all your heart. 
Truth is, a divided heart could be divided because of sinful pleasure. It could be divided because of another individual. It could be divided because of success. It could be divided because of recreation. It could be divided for many reasons. But we must understand that a divided heart is a tactic that the evil one will use to steal away everything that God desires and designed for you and I as believers. So let me ask you this question just briefly. Just take a moment and consider this. What does your heart look like? Is it discouraged? Is it distracted? Is it divided? Or is it fully devoted to the one who created you and the God who saved you? You see, when we get our heart right with God, then all those other places are taken care of. If I love God with all my heart, I'm going to love my wife properly. If I love God with all my heart, I'm going to even love my enemy the way I should. You want to you wanna use a litmus test for how, you, how your relationship with God is? Ask yourself this, how do I love my enemies? The truth is a devoted heart to God will reveal itself in those ways. And so we, we need to wake up, first of all. It's that idea that Paul uses and he says, wake up, O sleeper. He's like shaking him. He goes, don't fall asleep. This isn't about your conversion. This is about every step after that. This is about the life that God gave you. Is it fully devoted to God? Or is there a little token piece that you're giving him and you're pursuing all these other things for your own glory? The next thing that I see in this passage was not just the fact that we need to wake up to the reality that we're at war, but we must remember our identity as we fight the battle. We sang that song. I, I love that song. But in verse 8, he reminds us of something that's critical, and I want, I want to take you there in verse 8 here of this passage. He says this. He says, For one time you were, you were darkness, he didn't say you were in darkness. You were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. This is critical. He reminds us when we get our identity right, everything else follows. When we get our identity right, it's critical because it informs all of our actions. He was like, don't do this and don't do that. But he goes, you were darkness. You're no longer darkness. You are light. Walk as children of light. I think it's important that we understand how powerful our identity is as Christians. As we live life, do we use that to inform every action, every decision? Do we say, you know, I shouldn't do that because I'm a child of God? Or I should do that because God would be pleased with that because I'm a child of God. My identity, the very essence of who I am, informs what I do or what I don't do. And oftentimes we just don't think that way. I remember with the kids, when they would leave the house, we would often say the first thing, don't forget you represent Jesus, you're a child of God. Number two, you represent the Sisson name. So live well, not perfectly. You're going to make mistakes, but live well, represent well, and remember who you are. Remember who you are. You know, one of the distractions that Satan will use is to cause you to forget who you are. And then all of a sudden, it's all about you and this big world that you're in, and you've forgotten that the God who created you, who gives you life every day and breath, has a plan for you. You are a child of God. Live as a child of God. Choose as a child of God. Walk as a child of God. We must remember our identity as we fight this battle. The last one is that we must recognize God's response Look at that last part of verse 14. Sometimes it just gets overlooked, and I, I think it's worth our attention. In verse 14, he says, For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, 
and arise from the dead. And then what's that last statement? And Christ will shine on you. I think we must recognize God's response as we wake up. So he's like, wake up, wake up. And sometimes we think that we're in this world and sometimes we might have a discouraged heart, a divided heart, a distracted heart, and that God's calling us out and he's saying, I wanna condemn that, I wanna judge that, I wanna do something. He says, no, what I wanna want do is I wanna shine light in this darkness. I wanna come alongside of you and I wanna expose what you can't see. He's not there to condemn us. He's there to empower us, to help us overcome the darkness that is present around us and to give us the victory that can only come through his power. I think of it in this way. Have you ever, if you're a kid, have you ever had one of your parents call you into a time and they say, hey, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna meet with you for like, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I, I wanna have a talk with you. The first thing that you're doing as a kid, you're going through your head of anything you've ever done wrong in your life. I remember doing this to my kids, you know, hey, we need to talk. That, that's a beautiful moment for me because I don't even know half the stuff that's going on, but I know they're thinking it through. <laughs> I'm like, God, use these moments in their life. And we have this idea of, you know, then I go in and I sit down with dad and I'm just wondering what he's gonna say. And he says, hey, I know you're struggling with this. I want you to know I'm here for you. I know you're really, you're, you're battling through some things and I don't think you're being the person that God wants you to be, but I want you to know I'm here for you. I'm not against you, I'm for you. I wanna champion the things that really matter. I want you to know that you're not alone. You know what, that's a game changer. Instead of, you know, you're a loser. You know, somebody who is a Christian should never live like that. You, you know, you just start to condemn and berate and all of that. God does not do that with his children. Does he discipline? Yes. Should Christian parents discipline? Yes. But in love so that they know their kids know who is for them. And those Christian parents are more for their kids than anyone else in this world. And I'm here to tell you that the God who created you is more for you than he is against you. He is not against you. He is for you. To shine light in the darkness, to expel the darkness, and to expose the things around you. You ever have somebody show up with a flashlight? You're standing there in the dark and they turn that flashlight on and it just like illuminates everything. You're like, oh, hey, that's helpful. Because you were in the dark before, but now you're in the light. And you begin seeing things that you never saw before. He says, walk close enough to me, walk with me, walk as children of light so that I can expose the darkness around you so that I can inform you of the things that surround you, so that I can expel the very darkness that is trying to consume you. There is a battle raging. And it's not a battle your neighbor is facing or someone in front or behind you is facing. It's a battle that you are facing. And it's a battle for your heart. Somebody's gonna win that battle. It's not a draw. And I think as believers, as we go through life after our conversion, we have these moments where, yeah, I have a divided heart, I have a discouraged heart, I have a distracted heart, I'm losing this battle, but I come before God and I say, God, I need, I need your power, I need your victory, I need your help to win this battle. I no longer want to walk in the way that I've been walking. I need your help. Deliver me. Help me win this battle. And the God who created us, it says, shines light upon us when we come to him with that posture. 
to help aid us in accomplishing what he desires for us. So let me ask you these reflective questions. First of all, who or what has the affections of your heart? Who or what has, has the affections of your heart? Number two, remember your identity. Who you are should inform what you do and what you don't do. And then number three, realize God is for us, not against us, so that we can live the life that he created us to live, the beauty, the abundance that he wants us to experience. It's beautiful, isn't it? I'm scared. I'm scared that we've kind of just allowed this to be, well, it's don't get crazy on me type thing, you know? This is just life. Don't, don't get radical. I'm not getting radical, we're getting real. Truth is, if we lose sight of this reality that there's a battle for our heart, we will become victims, not victors. We will find ourselves in a place that we never thought we'd be and so God is warning us and the, the alarms are going off. Church, church, wake up, wake up. The evil one wants your heart. He wants to take away everything that God intended for you. There's a battle that rages day and night. It's not a question of whether there's the battle, it's who is gonna win. And God says, through my shed blood and my broken body, you can win because I've already won. You can win because I've already won. That's the victory that we have. I do not fight this with willpower. I do not fight this with my own ability or friendships around me and just accountability. I fight this in the power of the shed blood of Jesus. And that's how I will overcome. That's what wins the battle. That's what brought my salvation and that's what brings my sanctification. It's in his power, it's in his blood that we can do this. So it's fitting that we observe this table and we remember that. So God, this morning as we just take a moment to reflect on the reality of the battle that rages, we also want to embrace the fact that we don't have to be victims to this, this war, but that we can be victors because you are victorious, that Jesus, you won, and we stand in your victory. So God, help us even as we observe these elements to remember that so that if we have a divided heart or a distracted heart or a discouraged heart, God, that we would open-handedly hand that to you and say, God, I need victory through your shed blood. Give me a devoted heart. Remove anything that needs to be removed and bring purity and cleanness back to my heart so that there's, it's not 99%, it's 100% devoted to you. So Jesus, we ask for that. In your powerful name, amen.